what we look, last looked at in looking at the performance of uh, monochromator, okay? And this is the last one to look into the, the quality of radiation that is comes out from the monochromator. So one of it is, or the last one that we are going to talk about is spectral bandwidth. So it's the bandwidth of radiation that is output by the monochromator. And how do we look at the spectral bandwidth? Essentially, we look at this, the effective bandwidth, okay? The range of wavelengths at half peak height, half the maximum peak height. I'm going to mention it again that you never get a single wavelength coming out. That is the ideal situation, but it does not happen in real life. You are going to get uh, maximum uh, transmittance or intensity at the chosen wavelength but we are going to get a range of wavelengths some below some above okay where as we can see the smaller the effective bandwidth the higher the quality of the radiation of course okay because that's what we want we want only a single wavelength but due to the uh, you know, the mechanics, the optical arrangement, and we will see uh, next week probably some other factors which make it impossible to get a single line. Make sure you get these handouts. Huh? Now, related to the monochromator is the slit width that will control, that will influence the bandwidth. So one of the factors some mechanical thing that we do is to set the slit width. Remember, the monochromator has an entrance and an exit slit width. So that is one of the factors that will influence the bandwidth. And in some instruments, you have a variable slit width. Some instruments, they have only certain positions. Okay, Maybe they give you three options for the slit width. Some are variable. So look at this equation here to show the effective bandwidth. Is a function of the slit width, which is W. So usually we have slit, the entrance slit width and the exit slit width to be the same. You don't have it two different values. And what do we have here? Linear dispersion. Remember we had linear dispersion is nanometers per millimeter. We were talking about the focal plane. If you have uh, three, the, the how the wavelength dispersion, imagine having three people at, in one of these tables compared to six. Okay, so the higher linear dispersion is having three compared to the six all crammed together. Okay, so the that's how so this the linear dispersion is the lower it is we can see that it also narrows down the effective bandwidth similarly uh, it's also proportional to the slit width so this particular diagram here is to show you is that too cold as we have uh, these are different settings of the monochromator where we, if we set it at lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, and we have this wavelengths, uh, this radiation coming out <coughs> through the slit width. So this is the exit slit width. And so the slit, it has a certain width. The exit slit has, has a certain width. And to show that, okay, if we set it at lambda 2, if we set the monochromator at lambda 2, which means that lambda 2 will come out and have a maximum uh, output here. However, we are also going to get um, some wavelengths, as we said, higher than lambda 2 and lower than lambda 2. And so that's what we have here. And this is the situation where the effective bandwidth 
is equal to half the bandwidth. Okay, the slit width chosen is uh, such that you have the effective bandwidth is um, is half the the bandwidth here, half the uh, where the monochromatic setting of lambda two. Okay. So this is the bandwidth, the range of wavelengths, and the effective bandwidth is chosen such that uh, it's half the bandwidth, because as we see the the exits. The slit width is chosen such that it's equal to the difference between these two wavelengths. So here we're taking three, the case where the difference is the same. Lambda 1 between lambda 2 and lambda 2, lambda 3 is the same. We equal, equal difference. And we take it that the slit width is equal to that. Between lambda 2 and lambda 1 or lambda 2 and lambda 3. So we find that even if you set at a certain knee, at a certain wavelength, we are going to get these other wavelengths coming out. To, to see how that equation is being used, let's say you are given the reciprocal uh, linear dispersion, D negative 1 is 1.2 nanometers per millimeter, and you now want to separate two wavelengths. See how close they are, okay? Two sodium lines, 588.9950 and 589.5924 two very close wavelengths. Now we want to see for this monochromator. Remember, the linear dispersion is a characteristic of a particular monochromator. So now, what is the slit width required? What is W required? Now, the effect of the slit width on resolution, we must choose that the slit width must be equal to half or less than half the distance between the two wavelengths. And not more. We now see three instances where what is different with in these three instances is the slit width. Slit width relative to the difference between the wavelengths, I suppose. They are all the same. We're looking at how these three wavelengths are going to be resolved, how well separated they are going to be depending on the slit width that you use. Same monochromator, different slit width, different W. That means D negative 1 is also the same because it's the same monochromator. But you want to see now how well separated are these three wavelengths depending on the slit width. So if you have here, um, the bottom is the lowest. So okay, the relative slit width is 2, 3 and 4. So the... <coughs> The bottom one is the one with the narrowest slit width. We see that with this particular slit width, when what we are looking on the right side is now the light that comes out as we change the setting from lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3. If we could continuously change, you know, the monochromator, remember what, what do we change to, to decide which wavelength will come out of the exit slit? The position of what component are you changing to choose a particular wavelength that comes out? What is it? We have two kinds of monochromators. Now we're talking about monochromators, okay? So you see the entrance and the exit, entrance and exit slate. One here, we're using the prism, here, using the grating. What are we? What component, the position of what component are we changing when we decide whether lambda 1 or lambda 2 comes out? Position of the grating or position of the prism. So when you say you want to, so now we assume that we can continuously change the position of the grating such that first lambda 1 comes out, then lambda 2, lambda 3, that's all we time to look at. So we, as if you are the detector outside that exit slit, and we are changing the wavelength continuously and you are seeing the light coming out. So we set it uh, somewhat below 
below lambda 1 we don't get anything and as we continuously change the wavelength uh, we are going to get the three different wavelengths coming out but <coughs> they will have a certain each wavelength will have a certain effective bandwidth remember which is dependent on the slit width dependent on the d negative one okay so that's why this thing this effective bandwidth so here when we use slit in position two we get separation no overlap between the three wavelengths okay so we say this is good resolution and you can calculate the effective bandwidth if you know the, the width and the d negative one you go to position three where three is now more the slit width you have opened it up more we find that if we look at the light coming out of the exit slit again with respect to wavelength you are now going to get overlap between the three wavelengths so you will get here here you won't get any light but as you change it towards lambda one it will increase up to the maximum and then as you move further up you will get it will the light from lambda one will overlap with that of lambda two so you essentially you don't get a good separation as you did here okay overlap between the three wavelengths so if you if you set it at this wavelength okay you get max but somewhere in between you have some overlap so the resolution is poorer compared to this now as you go further up increasing the exit slit remember you increase w you increase the effective bandwidth the fatness of the peak okay if you can imagine that as we go from here to here you are getting uh, peaks with fatter triangles so when you get three fat triangles you get total overlap between the three so essentially here at this setting you cannot distinguish at all <coughs> between the three wavelengths you only get you know uh, um, a sum of all the three wavelengths essentially and you don't get separation because what we want is what's the point of all these things you know the monochromator to see one wavelength to set for example you're interested in copper i set it at three to four i want only to detect radiation at three to four but here you find that if you even if you set at lambda two you are going to you cannot distinguish from the other three Okay, that means the neighboring uh, wavelengths also if the radiation beside that three to four is also going to add up to the intensity so to show how the slit width effect affects the resolution the ability to distinguish between neighboring wavelengths that are close to one another and again here it's not atomic but you know to show um some band spectrum here the bandwidth is 0.5 1 and 2 nanometers so increasing bandwidths uh, <coughs> and we have seen as we have seen the diagram just now here you get separation between the na narrow peaks as you increase the bandwidth you get some overlap and here you know that it's not well resolved okay you're going to get i mean it's not totally a uh, big uh, peak but still you can see that the resolution is not as great as the first one we say that in analysis we do two kinds qualitative and quantitative qualitative means maybe we are just interested in uh, you know looking at the the where the peaks are for example in infrared spectroscopy you want to identify okay the oh peak is at this wavelength the if you have a benzene ring it will the peaks will be at a certain you know at a certain another region so you want the narrow sharp peaks so in qualitative analysis where you're just interested in where the peaks are to identify what they are what a particular functional group is in the compound or something like that you need narrower slits okay narrower slit widths 
for qualitative analysis because you want that pattern, you want that sharp peaks, that pattern so that you, are get, you can identify them. But for quantitative analysis, quantitative means you set at a certain wavelength and you want to measure the light. So there, slit widths can be increased because too narrow a slit width, too little light coming through. Okay? The narrower the door, of course, you know, less light. Less people can come through, less light can come through. So for quantitative, you, the intensity of the light is important. If it's too narrow, too little light, I mean, how much you cannot measure. Because for quantitative, you want to relate the light to the amount of your sample or whatever. So that's the difference there in terms of, you know, the, what kind of slit widths you will require. For monochromators, you have an entrance and exit slit width. For a particular monochromator, you have a particular linear dispersion characteristics D negative 1. The bandwidth is dependent on the slit width as well as D negative 1. And why do you want the... We can see how the slit width affects resolution, okay, affects the effective bandwidth. And here we see for qualitative and quantitative analysis, which one would be required. Any questions on that? Because we are, more going, to, we are going to leave monochromator and now go to um, detectors. So if we look at our components here of our Let's just look at the absorption, the main components for the instrument. I mean, this whole chapter is on that, okay, different components. We've looked at the sources. We've looked at the wavelength selector. Either you want to use filters or monochromators. Now we want to look at the detector. Because this sample part will be dependent on, when we talk about atomic absorption, it will be different. When Dr. Lim talks about molecular absorption, it will be different. So we will not get into that. Okay. The simplest detector is, of course, your eye. Okay. Uh, we don't have any classic, classic spectrometers. You call instruments that measure absorption or looks at emission spectrometers or spectrophotometers. But more classic instruments uh, let's say to look at emission, use a telescope. So use the eye. So where that, you, again, maybe you can find it online, you know, the, the picture of uh, these very old instruments where, let's say, maybe you've never done it before. You know, if you take a, a metal spoon containing um, some calcium salts and you heat it up, the color will be different. If you take some strontium, it will be different. Strontium salt, you don't have to take the metal, I suppose. If you heat up the salt and you get emission from that element, it will be different. So based on that, that the color of the light is different, you can also you know, make some qualitative identification. Or uh, as we go back to the eye is, we don't have the monochromator or the filter, but you use the eye and use the angle. So you search at which angle you can see the, the light. Okay. Or another one is to use uh, photographic plates or films, where if you can imagine uh, at the exit slit, the detector is actually a photographic plate. And I'm maybe in this digital age, even that you can't think of film, develop film. Have you ever developed any film for a camera? No. Never had such a camera, never had to put in film. But now, nah, when you were small, younger, when you're younger. Okay, so what happens there actually is some, some silver, some whatever lah some developer that you use so, so you get your light and your dark right so here it'll be the same thing so you have some photographic film on a plate outside the exit slit and the different wavelengths will then make different lines on your photographic plate 
So you have, a, when you develop the plate, you will get just lines. Where there are light, you get black lines. And then you have, the, you have to identify, this black line is for what element? Okay, so it will, be, it will be all on just one plate, on a two-dimensional plate. So you need to go to some instrument that will then have, you have a master plate, another plate which has lines but which has been identified. Okay, this line is for sodium. And sodium has three lines. Okay, you now have an instrument where you put the master plate and your own plate. And then you have to look, okay, match. Okay, which, which line is which line, you know. That's what it is. Okay, so sodium, okay, you must match. Not only must you match one line, but you must match at least another line. Maybe you, because you look at it wrongly, okay. So sodium, okay, two lines match, okay, sodium. The darkness of the line will show you the concentration. Because the more concentrated sodium is in the sample, the more light you get, the more emission, let's say. So the, dark, the darkness of the line will tell you the concentration. So, I mean, that is the life of the using a detector where you use uh, photographic detection. Okay? And we will see um, later on, I guess, uh, how the name will be different, whether you use photographic plate or the, com the detectors which you now use. Okay? So those are the classic things. Either you use a uh, telescope to use your eye as a detector or photographic plates or films. Of course, now as we move into the electronic age, we now have other kinds of devices which um, will do the same thing. Okay, so because you have radiation, now you want to get it to some electrical signal. And we have two kinds of um, detectors, photons, photon detectors and thermal. Remember, you, the UV vis will be photon detectors. IR, which is infrared, is more heat, so it's thermal detectors. We've talked about this, the photoelectric effect. You have some surface which is capable of uh, absorbing the radiation. The radiation then causes uh, ejection of electrons. And so when you have flow of electrons, you have a current. Okay? Uh, it's used in UV visible and near infrared. For infrared, what's the difference between photons of infrared and photons of UV in terms of energy? Here. UV, IR. Energy, which photon has more energy? UV or IR? UV. Greater energy, but lower wavelength. Higher uh, frequency compared to IR. So that's why the photon detectors just now could be used for UV, visible, and near IR, the one that's near the visible, but cannot be used for uh, IR instruments. So IR instruments, re you require thermal detectors because the energy of the infrared radiation is not enough to kick out those electrons in the photo photon detectors. Ideally, uh, properties of a detector should be high sensitivity, which means that um, you know, for small amount of radiation, you get a signal, you get a high signal, high signal to noise ratio. And it should have a constant response to a large range of wavelengths. It cannot be that you know it's more sensitive to UV compared to visible. No, it must be the same same response. It just must depend on the intensity. Fast, of course, fast response time. So if we look at the how it should, ideally you have your signal, your electrical signal should be um, proportional to your intense power of your radiation okay s is the signal that you get current voltage whatever proportional to the power or the radiant power of your radiation however we are going to get the situation where when power is zero no radiation p is zero no radiation falls on the detector you still get a small signal which is called the dark current okay kd so when P is zero, this is zero, but you still get a certain signal, which is a dark current. So uh, instruments are equipped to totally eliminate this KD or reduce it. Okay, we will now look at the various 
photon detectors. Another ancient one that you won't find in your instruments nowadays is called the vacuum phototubes. Why do we want to look at it? So that we understand the more complicated ones. Like we have said last time, it's based on this photoelectric effect. Okay, You have an uh, envelope made out of uh, quartz or some material and you have a cathode and you have your anode. Okay, So you have it... Uh, at a certain voltage uh, with respect to each other. Here we show the incoming radiation which hits the cathode because and the cathode is coated with some photoemissive material. Okay? Where the uh, photons will have enough energy to kick out an electron. And so that electron then is negatively charged, will be attracted to your anode and you get a current flow. Okay, so the power of the radiation is proportional to the current of electrons induced in the phototube. So simplest, one cathode, one anode. And incoming radiation. We move on to photomultiplier tubes based on that photo photon the that that uh, phototubes, okay? Where in, in this case of this photomultiplier tubes, it can handle radiation which uh, have lower intensity. Because for example, in this, in this case, this is limited by if the radiation is too low in intensity, that means the number of electrons you get is too small. Maybe not enough to, you know, to the signal is too small. So in that case, that problem is overcome by these photomultiplier tubes. Okay, used for measurement of low radiant powers. It works on the same principle except that we have one cathode, photoemissive cathode, containing that material that where the electrons will be kicked out from. But you don't have only uh, you have where's the anode? There's the anode. But in between the photoemissive cathode and the anode, you have uh, nine, what do they call them here? Dynodes. Numbered one, two, three, four, etc., etc. Okay? All this, you're looking at the cross section now of the photomultiplier tube. So as the radiation come in, comes in, if you follow through now, radiation H nu hits the cathode, ejects some electrons. These electrons are now um, directed towards number one. And one electron will, that, will, will then now hit dynode 1 and produce several electrons. And the electrons produced from 1 will then go to dynode 2 and do the same thing. So when, as it goes from 1 to 9, you get a multi, multiplication of the number of electrons produced. In fact, one photon originating from you know one photon falling on this first uh, on the cathode, you will end up with a million or ten to the seven electrons. So you get a multiplication of the number of electrons formed. So even so, it will work with low intensity radiation, where because you get a mul you will multiply the number of electrons formed. So the signal that you get eventually is not going to be so low. Okay. So this is the photomultiplier tube. Then you go on to your semiconductors where you have it, where it's based on a, essentially a photodiode. You took physics, right? Everybody took physics, semiconductors, N junction, P junction. Go and read it up. No physics, no physics lecture here. But essentially P region means positive. Are there such things as positive things? It's just positive means no electron, less electron. And regionally negative, more electrons, you know. But to think of it simply, okay, you have your plus and your minus, and you have your junction in between your P region and your N region. Now, if you were to have a reverse bias PN junction, you produce a depletion layer, okay? So that conduction is zero, depletion layer, no, no conduction within that band. So a photodiode, a reverse bias photodiode, when you have radiation falling on this thing, on this reverse, on this um, photodiode, 
it will then uh, produce holes in electrons in the depletion layer and you have your current flow okay so the current flow is due to the impinging radiation so this is the basis of the photodiode more sensitive than the vacuum photo tubes the one photo tube however less sensitive the, than the photo mouth based on that photodiode we now go to what is called a linear array a linear array of diodes array means many things many similar things want you know um, lined up linear means it's in a line so you have many diodes next to each other and so here is a cross section of an end uh, where you have your p-type silicon and you have your depletion layer and you have your n-type here so just now you had just the one photodiode n and p here but you have now many many uh, p and in a substrate of n-type so you have a linear array and this is the top part we're looking at the uh, from on top where you have uh, linear array, linear diode array detector. Just now you're talking about one, now you have many, many detectors side by side to each other. And where you come now to what is called a multi channel detector. You know, you have an array of diode, diode array detectors which are multi channel. Um, either one dimensional or two dimensional and it's placed in the focal plane of the grating or prism allowing detection of all the lines of the spectrum simultaneously and so you do not need a monochromator in terms of how many you have how many of these individual diodes you have it could range from 64 to 4000 over usually it's about 1000 to 24 diodes so you have all these imagine all these diodes one next to each other so if the radiation falls on this diode it can be detected if it falls in this angle it can be detected too so you don't need the monochromator anymore as we will see in this diagram here this is the grating okay you have your lamp your cell and your entrance slit and you have your grating you no longer now need an exit slit last time you had an exit slit because you want to only restrict one wavelength coming through coming through and now with your photodiode array you don't need that exit slit to limit the one wavelength because you have now a linear photodiode array where you can now simultaneously detect these many many wavelengths which come out of course you, you're not going to get wavelength at every you know every here depending on your sample you know what what wavelength will come through so this is the multi-channel detector where you can then go on to think about multi you know detecting many wavelengths at the same time um, this is more the kind of detectors that you will see in the instrument nowadays um, charge transfer devices you have your charge injection device or your charge couple device much more sensitive uh, a wider dynamic range greater signal to noise ratio they match or are even better than photo multiplier tubes rarely do you find instruments with uh, photo multiplier tubes because these charge transfer devices uses detectors which are so small and they're all made up of you know this uh, uh, an example a two-dimensional one will have so many rows of detector elements each row containing 388 so you have an array of you know however many and on such a small chip okay so you have a simultaneous uh, detection of your spectrum let's say remember you have your two-dimensional uh, spectrum your wavelength versus your order from your e-shell which can be now detected on your small silicon silicon chip 
I do not want to go. I never, I never want to discuss this. I always make you all read it. So this is your, I think your charge transfer. So essentially, you know, you have your charge transfer, and the other one is your charge. What was that now? Uh, charge injection. Again, radiation must hit the the detector, and so it will, you know, cause some charges to move, or cause some charges to be uh, collected, etc., etc. Next, we want to look at um, thermal detectors. As we have said, the infrared radiation cannot be detected by those detectors that we just mentioned just now. Because why? The energy of the photon is too low to cause that kicking out the electrons or moving of the charges. So you have another category of detectors which are specifically used for infrared radiation. You have your thermocouples, bolometers, pyroelectric transducers. I'm sure you have discussed thermocouples. What do you, how, what do you remember of thermocouples? No. Two different metals, you know, uh, will put into a particular temperature. Put into water, it will, you will have some some signal, some different, you know different conductivity between the two two metals and you will get some kind of a, a voltage difference or something like that electrochem no 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 electrochem here just two different metals no 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 oxidation reduction no it's just the two different metals in a particular where you have heat difference you know different metals will have different thermal conductivity right so based on that because IR is basically heat, heat energy. So you have, it's not as simple as that, but it's based on that, you know, that, that, that story of uh, here, where you have bimetal junctions. Bimetal junctions means two different metals where <coughs> the potential will vary as a function of temperature. So you use, you will, you will use this in your IR spectroscopy just to mention that, you know, this is, uh, one example of a uh, detector used in IR and you have your bolometers uh, which works on a different <coughs> different basis where you have strips of metal whose resistance now changes as a function of temperature um, or you have your pyroelectric transducers where you have these crystalline wafers of different material having uh, se uh, being sensitive again to <coughs> their polarization is dependent on temperature so the, these different kinds of uh, detectors which are essentially something some characteristic of that detector changes with respect to temperature because as I said IR is basically heat heat energy Something that has to be mentioned also, you know, is fiber optics. How light can travel through long distances through fiber optics, through very fine strands of glass or plastic that can transmit radiation over long distances. So essentially, you have your very fine uh, fibers which are hollow and essentially what happens to the light in order for it to travel along along that fiber is total internal reflection will have to um, will have to take place why do we went, want to mention it here is to this spectrophotometer where you have your sample your solution in a cell you want to measure the absorption so you have to put your sample. Have you any of them in two, four, three? Have you done any of that? Expert done the spectrophotometry. Put something in the cell and measure the absorbance. Okay. So you use the cuvette, right? But the cuvette has to go into the instrument in a certain position in the instrument. Now, let's say if you wanted to, you had a reaction external in a reaction vessel and you want to measure the <coughs> variation in absorbance that occurs as the reaction occurs, let's say. So the reaction vessel cannot, you cannot put it into your cuvette. Okay? So now, 
there is an, ass an accessory to the instrument, not all instruments of course, where now you have some fiber optics. That means you have, because the light must come out from the lamp through the whatever and go into your solution. So using fiber optics, you send the light through outside of the instrument into your reaction vessel and then you have another fiber optic which will then take it back to the instrument. But uh, the, the, it, the light will go through, through a certain portion of your reaction vessel. So there you have your some uh, accessory where you uh, which use fiber, fiber optics to measure absorbance of something external to the instrument. Okay. So maybe if you have not done it yet, you might say, okay, what, what, what am I talking about? But you know, uh, it's just that the cell, the sample is no longer in the cell, but outside here. So you need to get the light out and then go back so that it can be detected to measure the absorbance. They're all optical instruments. Optical usually because it's in the visible region. <clears throat> maybe it goes into the UV. When you talk about spectroscope, this is the one I said that, you know, Instead of the exit slit, you have a, like a telescope, an eyepiece that you look into it. And so you measure, oh, where, when you see light, okay, then you measure the angle. Okay. Spectroscope. Colorimeter uh, to do me measure, absorption measurements. Where, again, if you were to go and work in pen fabric, some textile, where they do a lot of dyeing of the dyeing of cloth so they want okay customer says I want this this color so you know how do they match uh, they do some quality quality checks on that the color that is wanted is the color that you produce in your <coughs> in, on your textile or whatever so there they use some color meter it doesn't have any fancy detector it's just basically you know some you have to use your eye uh, through the through the instrument to you do some uh, Comparison of colors, essentially. Okay. Photometers are instruments that use filters because we say filters are not that expensive. So when you do wavelength selection, you either use filters or monochromators. Those that use filters are called photometer. Has anybody done the flame photometer? Use a flame. Who has done that? Do you have to change any filters? No, again, okay. you just change the, the dial. Okay, but actually you are changing the dial, it's not a monochromator base, it's filters. So it's a flame photometer. The name photometer means it's using a filter, not a monochromator. Just now I was telling you about detection using photography, uh, using photographic film, it's a spectrograph. Uh, The other one will be spectrometer or spectrophotometer. Okay, measures intensity uh, as a function of wavelength only. Spectrometer or spectrophotometer where you measure the ratio of the two beams in absorption spectroscopy. You measure PO and PP and you measure the ratio. <coughs> Spectrofluorometer is used for fluorescence. So be familiar with uh, the most important ones here is photometer, spectrometer and spectrophotometer because we don't have any spectrograph anymore. We never had any ever since I was here. Uh, and, but we have sp spectrofluorometers also. And with that, I finished this class. I want to